Good day, my most beautiful, beautiful of people. Today, we are going to witness the final death throes of the modern age. We will look at how Europe and the rest of the world dealt with the Second World War, and then we will begin to investigate, approach a new world order where we move from the the old era the modern era that's confusing right into a new world order a post modern era are these lines and dates as far as eras go written in stone and completely uh, clear no no but we are certainly approaching a new age let us begin the modern age well two world wars were the death knells of the modern age. Does it end abruptly in 1945 with the closing of the Second World War? No, certainly not. Uh, many aspects of the modern age continue into the 1960s, 70s, even to the present day. Please don't think that I am arguing for a moment that the modern age ends and a postmodern era begins. However, the wars set into motion what was already happening by the late 19th century and by the 1960s we are clearly entering a new age and we will stop our investigation right as we approach the early 1960s because again that is such a very different time um from what it uh, 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 uh what preceded it out of the ashes out of the ashes. It was out of the ashes of the Second World War that the modern age began to truly, truly die. Aftermath of the Second World War. This war changed everything. It changed the way people thought, acted, what they believed in. Every part of life was affected in countless ways throughout the world. The war also witnessed old empires begin to fade and new ones emerge. We go from having a multi-power world to a, a bi-superpower world, just two superpowers uh, dominating the globe. The Nazis surrender with the suicide of Adolf Hitler. Um, the war is over. And in the United States and Britain, there is very much uh, a celebration on the streets, but in Europe, continental Europe and pockets of, of Britain, certainly because of the Battle of Britain, we have absolute destruction. We have absolute destruction. Ancient cities, medieval cities are turned into ruin because of carpet bombing, because of block by block combat. Uh, Berlin especially, Berlin especially was terribly, terribly uh, hit. Berlin itself is under a Soviet occupation. Uh, those Soviets are eager to avenge the crimes that were committed against them with the Nazi occupation of the Ostfront. This is every uh, National Socialist's nightmare. Here we have uh, an Asiatic, they would call Mongol, uh, Bolshevik, foot soldier on the streets of Berlin when no men are around, just women, children, and the elderly. Civilians, my God, please don't forget about the, the civilians. Hundreds of thousands of, 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 of Germans are killed because of the carpet bombing. Millions of people are dead throughout Europe. Certainly, certainly. I will look at death rates in a little bit, but look at the look on her face. This is, this is the true face of war, and this is what is happening to Europe in the in the days after the German surrender. There is a refugee crisis. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are walking the roads um, and side uh, uh, paths of, of Europe looking for anything, food, shelter, loved ones. What about Jews? Well, right up until the last minute, the Germans are eager to cover their tracks, so to say. Uh, they burn every document they can. Uh, they kill a great many more victims in the Holocaust as the Soviets and Americans and Brits approach these camps. These uh, people were liberated by uh, troops. They were on their way to the camps. They would have assuredly been killed. The camps themselves are being liberated by the Soviets, the Americans, and the British. 
sadly, many of the people that are liberated still die. They were so badly injured, so badly, badly in need of a great many things. Absolutely horrific. Absolutely horrific. The Americans made local Germans go and see what was being done. You heard rumors. You smelt things. You heard things, and you chose to ignore it. And so German civilians who lived in the areas of some of these camps were forced to see the atrocities. These women are exiting the theater. They were also forced to see the victims of these camps. Lest anyone forget what has happened in these walls. Here are SS prison guards being forced to uh, deal with, with their victims, their victims. These are German soldiers being forced to watch footage of the concentration camps. Again, this is what you were responsible for, whether you had a firsthand uh, 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 partaking of this is, is neither here nor there. You were part of the machine that was doing this. Here, a camp prisoner identifies an SS guard. There will be executions of, of camp directors and certain camp guards, although a great many will escape. A great many will go on to live very happy lives in Germany, Poland, etc. Many high-ranking Nazi officials, as we saw in our last lesson, committed suicide rather than face justice, especially when it comes to facing the Red Army. This is Heinrich Himmler, uh, the leader of the SS, responsible for a great many deaths in the Holocaust. Rather than fight to the to the, to, to the last stand, he takes a cue from his Fuhrer and commits suicide. What about the civilians? You know, a great many civilians were very, very, very happy to work with their Nazi overlords in places like Holland, France. Uh, women, especially, you might be given special privileges. You might be given food to bring home to your family. We can't be too critical of these women, although it is difficult not to sometimes. They, too, were desperate. But the war is over, Fraulein. The war is over, and so people want revenge. This is a time where everyone has lost someone they loved or at least were uh, close to in this war. And so when the war is over, vengeance is sought. Women who had comfortable relations with Nazi officers had their heads shaved in Holland and France, paraded through the streets, swastikas uh, painted on their foreheads. Harsh, certainly, but if you had lost loved ones, dragged out in the middle of the night because someone made a phone call or, 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 or paid a visit to the Gestapo, the secret police, well, you might be very, very, very hard-pressed to forgive. And so these women are paraded through the streets of Paris, Amsterdam, etc., complicit in the Nazi occupation of the continent. Now, these are the lucky ones, head shaved, slapped around. Um, many people were simply shot, dragged outside, and shot by civilians. You know who collaborated. You knew who was friendly and who wasn't. German POWs, as badly as these men are being treated, I promise you, had the Germans won, allied prisoners of war would have been treated far harsher, uh, at least Russian POWs, certainly. This man is responsible for war crimes against his POWs, and he is being executed. A very haunting image, nonetheless. Now, there was a trial. There was a trial, the Nuremberg Trials. In the end, I believe 12 are uh, sentenced to die. These are the architects. These are the architects of the of the uh, uh, Holocaust, of the Third Reich, of the 12 years that was supposed to last a thousand years. Some of these men played major roles in developing and spreading national socialism. Goebbels, the leader of the Luftwaffe, or the German Air Force, escapes justice by swallowing a cyanide tablet. 
That being said, that being said, the Americans uh, helped to rescue 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians. Some were uh, former leaders of the Nazi party, and they recruited them. They recruited them uh, into the uh, space program, into the rocket program. 1,600 German scientists were recruited by the Americans, pulled out of Germany, and put to work on the rocket program. The Cold War has already began, and so... Uh, the Americans are more than happy to help these people, bring them to the United States, and employ them uh, through uh, for uh, rocket development for the United States. Deaths. An estimated 70 to 85 million people die in this war, approximately 3% of the population. Deaths directly caused by the war, including military and civilian, were estimated at between 50 and uh, 56 million, between 50 and 56 million, approximately 19 to 28 million deaths were from war-related diseases and famine. 85% of the deaths for the record were on the Allied side. World War II deaths, 50% were Allied civilians, including Poles, Russians, Chinese. 27% were the Allied military. Axis, 15%, and then Axis civilians, approximately 5%. As far as the Allies go, by far, you can see by this graph, it was the Soviet Union that paid the ultimate price. Keep this in mind, because Stalin is never going to allow the Soviet Union to be in such a vulnerable position again. When we look at the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe, just know, those numbers are right in front of them. When the British and the Americans, who make up a very small fraction of those total deaths, criticize him, he'll say, well, where were you from the beginning? Why did you wait so very long to invade Normandy, to invade Italy, while we died by the millions? Approximately, approximately, uh, look at these numbers. Look at these numbers. 12.7% of the of 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 Russia gone 16.3 percent Ukraine gone 17.2 percent of Poland gone Belarus between 25 and 30 percent gone compared to France Britain Italy these are giant numbers absolutely giant numbers that's why I told you the majority of the killing took place on the eastern front between 20 and 24 million Soviets die in the, this war. That includes uh, 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 Ukrainians, Belarusians, etc. Giant, giant numbers. Approximately 15 to 20 million Chinese will die, the majority of those being civilians. Remember, the Japanese were just as harsh and killed approximately the same numbers uh, as the Germans in the West. Post-war Germany. Well, Germany was an rubbles. 95% of Berlin was ruined with half of it under a Soviet occupation. Germany will be split into two. It'll lose approximately 25% of its pre-war borders, pre-war territory. And by the 1950s, one out of five West Germans will be a refugee from the East. Here is Germany under occupation. The Soviet Union takes the East, while Britain France and the United States take the West. The city of Berlin is further divided. The old Prussian capital is further divided. In the end, in the end, the Soviets will help to install a communist East Germany, and the Americans and the British will help to install a pro-capitalist democratic West Germany. Here we go. Germany again is split. The Federal Republic of Germany, pro-Western, and the German Democratic Republic, Eastern. Germany is no more, not as it was. The dream of Bismarck, the reality of Versailles is dead. What about Prussia? What about Prussia? Prussia is dissolved. Prussia is dissolved. It doesn't exist anymore. They're blamed for the first and second world war that 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 martial kingdom from the 1700s that we saw explode onto the scene is blamed and germany in just what 70 years is no more 
the world is changing at a very accelerated pace in the uh, years uh, of, 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 of 1940 to 1950. Post-war Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union, not just Russia, that had paid the ultimate price. This is a, a very, 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 I find hilarious meme um, from, I believe, Reddit. Where else do you find good history, right? Uh, how people think World War, II, World War II was won, at least in the United States. And I can promise you, I went to high school in Great Britain. Um, it's taught there as well, but that would be a British dinosaur that pretty much the Americans showed up and defeated the Axis. In reality, they certainly play a pivotal role, the Americans and the British, but it's it's the Soviets. And they pay the ultimate price. This is a rather unfair uh, meme. I could, you see the French <laughs> running away. That's not quite fair, but you get it. You get it. You get it. Oh, here we can see Poland in uh, Germany's mouth. It's a very, it's 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 a very realistic portrayal of true events. Following the Second World War, the Soviet Union has the world's largest land army. These are battle-hardened Red Army soldiers. These are very battle-hardened soldiers. And Joseph Stalin never wants to be stabbed from the West again. Remember the First World War and the Second World War? Russia's ruin came from the West. And he decides, he decides he is not going to allow this again. So he decides to create a buffer zone, a buffer zone, the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe. Well, in Yalta, Joseph Stalin gets full permission to install on land that he has already occupied friendly governments. Well, what does that mean? Well, he takes it as a green light. He takes it as a green light. His soldiers occupy this entire region here. And before his soldiers pull out, he is um, certain to install pro-Soviet communist governments. He also rounds up. He also rounds up hundreds, hundreds of thousands of men and women who had resisted Germany. And he places them in work camps in Siberia. Why does he do that? They were fighting against Germany. Well, Stalin says a freedom fighter is a freedom fighter. If they're fighting for self-determination against the Germans, they're going to be fi fighting for self-determination against us. And so he rounded up men and women who helped defeat the Nazis and shipped them to uh, gulags in the East. He also threw out, kicked out 12 million ethnic Germans. Many of these ethnic Germans had been there for hundreds of years. Little German communities in Eastern Europe cast out. We want to cleanse this land of German uh, 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 citizens. This is the Eastern Bloc. Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. They all become pro-Soviet Eastern Bloc nation states. Winston Churchill in a speech that he delivered, I believe in Missouri, I could be wrong on that, announced that an iron curtain had descended across Europe. This isn't a physical curtain or a wall. Don't get confused with the Berlin Wall. But as far as the West was concerned, Europe has now been divided into free and unfree. For the Soviets, no, we're protecting our Western flank. These are some of the figures of ethnic Germans who were kicked out of their lands following 1945. Um, half a million will be killed before they can arrive in Germany as refugees. Here are German refugees being driven from Poland and Czechoslovakia. In many cases, their only sin was having Germanic blood and speaking the German language. Ethnic cleansing continues following the Second World War. This is a map of German-speaking peoples before and after the war. You can see great swaths of people pushed out of Central Europe. Many of those communities, again, had been there since medieval times. The Gulag camp continues. 
Stalin continues to export so-called enemies of the state out of Eastern Europe. For many East Europeans, they go from one totalitarian regime to the next. Those gulags in Siberia stay full under Stalin. Political dissidents, ethnic minorities, people who dare to question the status quo, find themselves employed for life in the gulag. For many of these people, it's a death sentence. It is a death sentence. Post-war Great Britain. The immediate post-war years for Great Britain were actually quite harsh. Um, the national treasury is nearly bankrupt. Many of the cities are destroyed because of the battle for Britain. Uh, the British will remain on rations until the early 1950s, 1954, I believe. We... I say we, I'm originally from Britain, um, I've been here a long time, uh, but the British were put on rations during the war. It continues. It continues well into the post-war years. Britain, quite frankly, is bankrupt. It doesn't have the money. It doesn't have the supplies. Life for Britons following the war had many questioning, well, who won the war? Who won the war? In 1945, the Conservative Party, the Tories, had just taken Great Britain to victory. The British are victorious. There's an election. It should be clear. Winston Churchill, the man who got us through the war, is up for re-election. His party's up for re-election. However, Labour, Labour makes an argument. Help them finish their jobs. Give them homes and work. Vote Labour. Now, the Labour Party was the Socialist Party, and they said, if a nation can wage war on an enemy, well, then a nation can wage war on poverty. A nation can wage war on inequality. A nation can wage war to raise the standard of living of its lowest citizens. Labor tells the British people, vote labor and win the peace. Vote labor and get a decent pension for your granny. Vote labor for a self-respecting job, for a chance at a real childhood for your children, vote labor, vote socialism. A vote for labor means a full national effort for housing. Industry, large industry must be nationalized, must be socialized, taken over by the government. Wait a minute. Is Mr. Marx coming up again? Is Karl Marx coming up again? Nationalization of industry? Surely labor is not going to win. Labor's not going to win. They're going to vote Winston Churchill. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Socialists in. Clement Attlee and Labor in a surprising defeat for the conservatives win. And they usher in socialism into Britain. Britain isn't the only one. A great many Western European countries begin to adopt socialism, not communism, but light socialism. Things like taking over national health. In 1948, Great Britain introduces a national health care system. Why should people struggle to pay for their health? By the early 1950s, they've also taken over many large industries. The government has taken over coal, aviation, telecommunications, transport, electricity, gas, iron, and steel. British Railway. The government taking over the rail system, the coal industry, the iron industry. Much of Britain is not only in ruin because of Luftwaffe bombs, but it's in ruin because of decades of poverty, decades of ruin. Labour England decides to knock these slums down and start fresh. Let's build homes for England's most needy, the working classes, and they do. These council estates are built across Great Britain. Many Englishmen were very, very happy to give up their row terraced houses for these high rises now with time these towers will uh come into dereliction and they're not all towers towers are used as an example as the most brutal uh, 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 uh offensive forms of public housing for the people but they are taken out of the slums and put in these council estates as they were uh, soon to be referred to now because of the mass death in the Second World War. And because Great Britain told its colonies, we are a family. We are a family, are we not? Come, fight for Britain. 
help Britain in its war against Germany. We're a family and the mass death. We need labor in Britain. And in the 1950s, many members of the colonies begin to cash in those promissory notes. Okay, we're a family. Okay, fair enough. And in increasing numbers to fill labor uh, 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 um, gaps, and for just in general to try to improve their station, we see mass immigration from places like Jamaica, India, uh, 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 various parts of the empire, changing the demographics of England forever, Britain forever. Are we not members of the empire? Are we not your colonial brothers? They arrive in England, changing the face of England. You'd have never seen diversity like this, racial diversity in the 18th century, even before the 1940s. Certainly, diversity exists, but nothing like the numbers we begin to see. Whole pockets of, 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 of cities change ethnicities. Here is a young Cypriot, I believe, a Greek Cypriot. Do these newly arriving uh, 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 members of the empire face uh, discrimination? Oftentimes, yeah, certainly, certainly, certainly. Housing discrimination, job discrimination. This is a new face, not the new face, but a new face of what it means to be British in the 1950s and 60s. Again, are we not a family? Post-war America, the post-war United States, well, in sharp contrast to Europe, America had escaped the ravages of war, and it emerges following the Second World War as an industrial powerhouse. 60% of the world's industrial production occurs in the United States by 1945. The gross national product, and this is how we measure all goods and services produced, in 1940, for the United States, 200 billion. 1950, 300 billion. 1960, 500 billion. By 1950, by 1950, the United States was firmly established as the richest and most powerful nation in the world. No one lives better, on average, than an American in the post war years. The United States also has a very, very large army. The Second World War has resulted in an American presence across the world, bases scattered throughout the world, 53 in Japan, 148 in Germany. The Americans aren't closing shop. They're not simply giving up these bases. No, 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 no. This is the American decade. No, wait. This is the American century. No, wait. This is the American millennium. They don't stop here. They don't stop here. One of the first things that the Americans do is they begin to pump Europe full of millions of dollars in aid, the Marshall Plan. We are trying to prevent a socialist revolution, a communist revolution in France, Italy. Many people have a very favorable view of communists following the Second World War. Did they not pay the ultimate price? And so we are trying to offset that, pumping billions into Europe. Uh, we're not going to get the money back, or at least not even a fraction of it, but that's okay. We prevent communism from taking over in Europe, and we create trade partners to buy American goods. It's a win-win, the Marshall Plan. In order to safeguard peace, in order to safeguard peace, following the Second World War, the United States helps to found the United Nations. The United Nations. We are never going to have another war like this because this one has teeth. Unlike the League of Nations created after the First World War, the United Nations will have teeth. And we will establish this United Nations where a family of nations can discuss things. Can We can talk it out. We can make decisions as a family. Here is the United Nations on land dedicated, uh, donated by the Rockefellers in New York. Again, the hope is, is that we can prevent another great war. New nations will spring up. In the ashes of the Second World War, new nations will emerge. Following the Second World War, 
three nations made up of three very ancient people. Please keep this in mind. Ancient people, new nations will be established. Interestingly enough, based on European models. We're going to have two republics, products of the Enlightenment, two republics, and a nation based on a Jewish intellectual's writings from the middle 1800s. My God. So these are ancient non-Western people, however, establishing new nations based on the ideas that we've been discussing all these so many lessons. Please keep in mind that these three nations and their establishment are only made possible because the world had changed so very much following the Second World War. The Republic, the Republic of India. As Britain struggled in the post-war years, its former colonies demanded independence, including the Raj, including the Oraj. Background, well, an entire generation of Indians had been educated on Western thought, Western philosophy, and they're going to argue for independence using Western language against the West, very interestingly. Since 1900, the Indian National Congress had been demanding self-rule from the British. And then Gandhi, a Western-trained lawyer and INC member, tried to hamper Britain's war effort. During the war, India is going to serve Britain very, very well. But Gandhi and other members of the uh, uh, Indian National Congress will tell the Indians, don't help the British. Peaceful resistance. And so they'll go on strikes. They will uh, 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 have demonstrations. That being said, a great many Indians play a pivotal role in the Second World War. I'm not taking from them, but this movement's going to build. It's going to build before the war and during the war. This independence movement. We're not helping the British. We need our independence. There is Gandhi as a Western-trained lawyer before he adopted that traditional, somewhat theatrical garb. 1931 in meetings in London. For the record, the Indians proved to be very, very loyal members of the empire. By the end of the war, the British Indian Army had become the largest volunteer, volunteer army in history at 2.5 million men. 2.5 million men. There were cases of mutinies. There were cases of Indian soldiers taking the side of the Japanese. But overall, overall, they proved themselves to be very, very loyal in this war. Again, they have no dog in this fight, but they are fighting for king and country. They are fighting for king and country. 87,000 Indians will die in the Second World War in combat. They didn't ask for this, but they are serving king and country very much so. Now, there were Indians saying, don't do this. Don't go and fight for them. But I'm telling you, overall, great many, 2.5 million. Following the war, Gandhi and others continued to press for Indian independence. They continued to press for their own voice. You see that that poison of nationalism, that poison of nationalism is present in this language, in this discourse. Gandhi wasn't the only one, but he's a very good figurehead, much like Martin Luther King for the American Civil Rights uh, Movement. By the way, Martin Luther King will be heavily influenced by Gandhi. This nonviolent protest against an enemy who is much stronger than you. There's no mistake that barring from Gandhi, the civil rights movement in the United States is gonna do so well. This movement will grow and grow and grow. More and more pressure is on Britain, which is bankrupt. They can't afford to say no. Had this been before the war, the British would not have agreed to anything. But in 1947, Viscount Louis Mountbatten that man in front of you, the last British governor general of India, announced the partitioning of British India into India and Pakistan. He is going to divide it. He is going to divide it. The British are going to divide India and give them their independence. That's the plan. That is the plan. 1947 is the date given usually for Indian independence, but it won't really be implemented until 1950. Now, there's debate in India. You're going to cut it up. Fair because they're going to cut it up on religious grounds. Remember, British India 
is much bigger than present India now. It goes from modern-day Pakistan all the way into Burma. They are going to divide it on religious grounds. It just mean that just makes more sense to ease into a more harmonious future. However, there are riots. Indian commu Hindu communities find out they're going to be in a Muslim country overnight. Muslim populations find out they're going to be in a Hindu majority nation overnight. Riots break out. Killings take place. In the end, these are the new borders that the British agree to. We have West and East Pakistan made up of primarily Muslim and India. Burma will have its own independence in 1948. India proclaimed a sovereign democratic republic, a product of the Enlightenment, a democratic republic. My God, the philosophes would have been very, very happy. Kashmir, Kashmir goes to India. Now, Kashmir is a place that is still hotly, hotly contested between Pakistan and India. This is going to be a great source of tension between these two nations, that region up there in the north. What about the Portuguese? Well, the French pull out, but the Portuguese want to hold on to those uh, little city-states, including Goa. And the uh, Indians actually force the Portuguese out through conflict. Only about 50 people were killed, but the Indians kick out the Portuguese, the first Western European powers to establish themselves in India. My God, the world's changing right in front of our eyes. In East Pakistan, guerrilla fighters fight for independence, and in the end, they win. Bangladesh is created. So now we have Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. The effects of Indian independence. Well, India is today the largest democracy in the world, uh, well over a billion and a half citizens. Um, it is a titan when it comes to uh, the economy. It is the sixth largest economy in the world and climbing quickly. Tensions continue along the India and Pakistan border. They have gone to war several times. Uh, if World War III breaks out, it very well could come from this border. Again, that is the danger of, of drawing up borders for people. Oftentimes, what looks good on paper doesn't take into account the reality on the ground. 1948, the state of Israel. The state of Israel. Out of the ashes of the Second World War, Theodore Herzl's and million of others Jews dream of Israel becoming a land for Jews becomes a reality after almost 2,000 years, a Jewish Israel returns to the world. Background. Well, we know, we've looked at this. In the late 19th century, Zionist settlers begin pouring into then Ottoman-controlled Holy Land. In the First World War, in the First World War, the British take over uh, Syria-Palestine. That is the region as it was referred we go from the Ottoman-controlled region to the uh, 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 British taking over, pardon me, the land of Palestine. Now, in 1917, the British, through the Balfour Declaration, promised to work towards a Jewish homeland. In 1917, they tell Jews in Israel and Jews around the world, we will help you work towards a Jewish homeland in Israel the Middle East, in the land of Palestine, Israel. This is the British plan. This is the British partition scheme. Jews will get everything at peach here. Arabs will get everything at pink here. And then that center region will be under British control, including Jerusalem, which is holy to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Well, riots break out. Riots break out in the late 1930s. They, re they, they begin to revolt against this plan by the British to divide these two states. It seems the, the British might have bar bitten off too much, more than they can chew, so to say. And in 1948... In 1948, the British hand over this part of the world to the United Nations. 
you guys handle it. You guys divide it up. We're done. We are done. They hand over Palestine to the United Nations. The United Nations, the United Nations sets up a special plan to divide this region. This newly formed body made up of the international community divided up. Everything yellow will be Arab. Everything uh, orange will be Jewish. And the city of Jerusalem itself will be administered to by the United Nations. The Jewish state was to receive 56% of the land of the mandate of Palestine, including 82% of the Jewish population. Now, this partition is approved by the United Nations. And for the most part, Jews support this drawing up of the map and the state of Israel is born. The state of Israel is born as soon as this Jewish state was born. Um, as people celebrate in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, I think Haifa was part of the uh, original UN markations, never mind New York. Um, Israel is attacked. Israel is attacked by its Arab neighbors. The Arabs do not want a Jewish uh, homeland here. They want it to remain Arab, and so they begin to attack. Israel is attacked on all fronts. Israel is attacked on all fronts. As soon as it's independent, it is attacked. Well, the Jews fight quite well and surprisingly do very, very well against their Arab invaders, and they actually increase their holdings. You can see that this war actually added to the land of Israel. This creates a refugee crisis. This creates a refugee crisis. In 1948, approximately 700,000 Arabs flee or are expelled by the Israeli military, kicked out or fleeing their land. They end up in refugee camps. They end up in refugee camps. These refugee camps are going to remain for decades. At the same time, at the same time, Jews in Arab Muslim countries face discrimination, attacks, even killings. And so from 1948 to the early 1970s, between 800,000 and a million Jews fled or were expelled from their Arab countries. Jews had lived in those Arab countries for thousands of years before there was even an Islam, but they are expelled. This is the this is this is this is this is what happens in times of war. Oftentimes, simply your religion or your ethnicity determines on whether your neighbor are going to kick you out or not. Israel welcomes the returning, returning the 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 arriving uh, uh, refugees from Arab lands. Uh, as of 2019. The total number of Jews in Arab countries and Iran, if you include Iran, uh, about 12,500. It used to be in the millions. It used to be in the millions. You can see here that in the 60s, there was another war. Israel gains land. In the 70s, there's another war. They negotiate land in the early 1980s. Israel has fought several wars. Uh, for its existence and for land and territory. After 1948, both the Soviet Union and the United States pay special attention to the Middle East. Why? Two reasons. Geographic location. It is a very, very important part of the world. And in this battle for the globe between the Soviets and the Americans, geographically, it's very important. And don't forget the importance of oil. Oil is going to play a giant role in the 20th century. And so both of these powers are going to pump billions into the Middle East and fight for the hearts and minds of the citizens there. The effects. Well, Jews built up Israel into a modern democracy, economy, a modern military. Um, they took the city of Jerusalem in the late 1960s after 2,000 years of not taking, not having possession of the city of Jerusalem, a very modern Mediterranean city, feels more European than Middle Eastern in so many ways. That being said, it is a highly militarized nation state. It has to be. It has a tiny population surrounded by many hostile neighbors. And that question over 
whose land is it and 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 where do those lines fall uh continue to make israel a source of tension hatred conflict uh, and terror quite frankly finally the people's republic of china the people's republic of china a very 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 uh interesting short history uh following the second world war that i'm going to give to you a short history now just so you know before world war ii china was experiencing a civil war between the communists and the nationalists the communists and the nationalists now in name china was ruled by the nationalists the kumotang the nationalists are anti-communist they are friends to the Americans. They are certainly, certainly not a democratic form of government. But the Americans support the Kumotang or the KMT. They are led by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek is pro-American. He is anti-communist. And so he receives American support in this civil war. He's our guy in China. And he claims to control China. He does control much of it, but not all of it. We have warlords. We have communist fighters in the countryside, which we're going to get to in a second. He is facing off before World War II against Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong is a communist nationalist fighter. He's a communist, but also a nationalist. I know it's confusing, but fair enough. Just think of him as a communist for now. Mao Zedong wants to make China communist. He is supported by the Soviet Union. Well, when the Japanese invade, both the communists and the nationalists join together to fight against the Japanese invaders. For this time, the communists under Mao and the nationalists under Chiang unite to fight against the Japanese. We both have a common enemy. We both have a common enemy. Now, Chiang Kai-shek is still recognized as the leader of all of China by the allies, Truman, Churchill, etc. Here is Chiang Kai-shek's wife visiting with Eleanor Roosevelt at the White House. Now, when the Japanese are defeated and they are expelled out of China, these two forces go back to war against each other. Now, the nationalists have the cities, but in the countryside, the communists have the loyalty of the peasants. Chiang Kai-shek is very angry because the British and the Americans withdraw support and urge him to come to the negotiation table. The, Jap the, 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 the British and the Americans don't want to get quickly involved into another civil war, and so they pull back. Chiang Kai-shek will feel betrayed, and the communists begin to do very well against the nationalists in the years after the Second World War. Here is Chiang Wei Kual. He is Chiang Kai-shek's uh, adopted son. Now, he was actually trained by the Germans um, and uh, will actually join the Weimar. But then he comes in 1938 to serve his, 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 his stepfather. He will uh, stay with his uh, 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 stepfather in the KMT. Interesting contrast between the face and the uniform, wouldn't you say? Anyways. By 1948, it's clear the communists are going to win. They take city by city full control, and the Kumotang, the Kumotang has to leave. They have to leave. They have to leave mainland China. They escape mainland China and occupy Taiwan. To this day, Taiwan and China, two separate uh, nation states, um, and the KMT will continue, continue to control Taiwan and call themselves China in the years following the Second World War. Mao Zedong is victorious. Mao Zedong is victorious. Here he is declaring independence and the creation of the People's Republic of China. Now, keep in mind, nation states use a great many names for themselves. Um, it's not a republic. It's not a republic. It's a communist state under Mao, a totalitarian ruler. The Reds win in China. The whole world is shocked when China goes red. No one more so than the Americans. They are terrified. Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and now Mao. My God. 
it seems that the Soviet Union is winning. The Soviet Union is winning. The whole world appears to be turning red. This will terrify the Americans. The effects. The effects. Well, today, China has the largest population, the second largest economy, um, and has done very well economically by slowly abandoning communism for a more state-controlled economy. Really, China is no longer communist. In many ways, it's fascist, meaning we allow for private industry, but the state retains control over private industry. And China is by far, by far um, not a free nation. They continue to claim Taiwan. They continue to build up their military. No, never, ever, ever allowing China to be what it once was in the 1800s when Western powers, as well as Japan, took advantage, bullied them, stole land from them. China has made a promise to itself to be taken seriously once again, even setting its sights on space. A new world order. A new world order. Following the Second World War, two superpowers emerged that will dominate the world's stage. Britain is still a player in this, but two major powers emerge, the Americans and the Soviets. Even in the final stages of the Second World War, the Cold War begins. This indirect proxy conflict that is going to wage well into the early 1990s. Now, these two superpowers are going to dominate events and discourse in the second half of the 1900s. The Soviet goal, well, it goes back to Lenin, continue to spread Marxist revolutions throughout the world. Workers of the world unite. The American goal to spread open market capitalism throughout the world, an open free market with American bases scattered throughout the world. America changes a great many ways following the Second World War. Uh, they established the Central Intelligence Agency in 1947. This is the, the International Spy Agency involving itself in a great many governments and eternal uh, 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 action throughout the world. The United States and the Soviet Union, for the record, are going to get involved in conflicts around the world. Both are going to support dictators, totalitarian regimes responsible for, for absolute genocide, all in the name of defeating the other one. Please keep that in mind. Both of them are going to do this. Both of them are going to support very questionable uh, uh, regimes in the name of defeating the other one. This is the Cold War. This is realpolitik. This is this is not what is right morally, but what is right uh, politically. In the early 1950s, we find out that the Soviets also have an atomic bomb. What? Wait a minute. We're not the only kid on the playground with a big old slingshot? No, they have one too. Soon we're going to enter the nuclear age. Both were going to develop nuclear weaponry, and both are going to engage in an arms race against one another. These weapons wipe out cities, not blocks. These weapons could bring in a Stone Age if detonated at once. In 1949, the United States establishes the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is NATO. It says this. If the Soviet Union attacks one member of NATO, we all jump in. The Soviet Union establishes the Warsaw Pact, saying the same thing. If the United States attacks East Germany, we all jump in. Suddenly, the world is a much more serious place. Any of you, any of you understand what it means when people enter into gangs, right? If a member of one gang gets into a fight with another member of a gang and there are other gang members around, it's never one-on-one. -on -one. Suddenly, Europe is a schoolyard full of two giant gangs that if, if two members 
want to fight. It's not going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's not going to be a bloody nose and a black eye. It's going to be a nuclear holocaust. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the world is a much more tense place. Nuclear war is a real threat. It's a real choice that these two superpowers can make. But we all feel the effects. We all feel the effects. If they go to war with each other, the whole world will have a nuclear fallout. The United States has not abandoned those bases. They continue to have those bases. They continue to have a presence throughout the world. Now, up until the Second World War, the Americans, for the most part, had been isolationist in nature. God had blessed the United States with two weak neighbors and two giant oceans. However, following the Second World War, increasingly, America becomes the policeman to the world, getting ourselves involved in a great many conflicts. Americans now ask themselves, if not us, who? We have to stop the spread of godless, brutal communism. We've taken the spot of the British Empire. The British Empire can't do it anymore. They're broke. And so the Americans continue, whether it be through themselves or the United Nations, to involve themselves in foreign entanglements. The United States stopped being isolationist following the Second World War and hasn't looked back since. One prime example of the United States now taking a proactive role in world events is when North Korea, supported by the Chinese and the Soviets, invades South Korea. Divi Korea was divided during the Second World War with the Soviets and the Chinese supporting the North and the Americans supporting the South. The Soviets and the Chinese are going to support North Korea when they invade South Korea. The communist North wants to unify all of Korea under one communist state. The Americans involve themselves through the UN in this conflict. Tens of thousands of Americans will die. Millions of Koreans are going to die. This is the first proxy war of the Cold War. Americans are now getting involved, not because Pearl Harbor was bombed, not because of a Zimmerman telegraph. No, because North Korea wants to invade South Korea. If we don't do it, who does? That is the argument. The Chinese will never officially enter the war, but they'll send in volunteers, 100,000 Chinese volunteers, and the Americans quickly meet their match. There's no winners or losers in this war. It's a stalemate. It's a stalemate until both sides put down their guns and agree to pretty much the border before the outbreak of this war. To this day, the border between North Korea and South Korea is one of the most militarized zones in the world. If World War III breaks out, it very well could break out in this region. Now, South Korea remained an American ally, ruled by a dictator, just so you know. South Korea wasn't a free nation, but it's pro-American. It has since developed into a very modern nation state. North Korea, not so much, increasingly isolated with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s. Look at energy use. South Korea, North Korea, and then China. Look at that, that vacant spot. North Korea is incredibly poor. North Korea loses millions occasionally due to famine. It is a strange outlier. Their leader is worshipped as a living god or a demigod. I guess the founder is a god. The people are incredibly poor, incredibly uh, 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 repressed. And the North Korean government puts what little money it does have into defense, into its military. Decolonization. Decolonization. Both the USSR and the United States were opposed to the very notion of a British or French empire. Both claimed that their form of government was much superior to imperialism. For the record, the Soviets are an empire and the United States has an empire during this time. But both openly oppose imperialism. The Americans viewed empire as competition to an open market. They also want bases overseas. The U 
SSR viewed imperialism as fundamentally counter to Marxist beliefs. Both the United States and the USSR will support nationalist movements to try to bring down empire. And when I say empire, I'm speaking mostly of the British here in red and the French there in blue. These two forces are going to actively work against the British and the French empires in the 1950s and 1960s. Nationalism in the developing world. Now, nationalism was born in the 1800s in Europe. The belief that humans should not be ruled by foreign families or faraway capitals, well, those ideas don't just stay in Europe. Those ideas spread. Again, one of those viruses from the 19th century. Nationalism comes to nations within the colonies. Ter people, not nations, people within the colony. Uh, is India not a perfect example of nationalism? They don't kick out the British and riot, try to recreate the Mughal Empire. No, they create a nation state. They even divide those lines along religious grounds. Now, the British Empire um, deals with nationalist movements. The British Empire, during the Second World War, by far the world's biggest, uh, begins to deal with nationalism. Now, for the most part, many people within the British Empire remain loyal uh, subjects during the Second World War and the years following the Second World War. However, over the 1950s, more and more colonial subjects begin to demand independence. I'm not going to say for a moment there weren't acts of violence and, 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 and fighting between the British and their colonial subjects, because that's certainly, certainly true. But by the time we get to 1970, the British Empire is a shell of what it once was, and a great many new nations had received their independence. This is the British Empire in 1945. This is the British Empire in 1959. This is the British Empire in 1974. A few islands here and there, pockets here and there. That's the British Empire. The French, the French seem to take it harder, losing their empire. The French seem to take it much harder, especially in two places, two places, Indochina and Algeria. We're going to examine the loss of Indochina and Algeria because both of those losses are going to have very, very long-term effects. The first Indochina War. Since the 1800s, the French had claimed Indochina, that is modern-day Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. French Indochina becomes a very important part of the French Empire. However, the Japanese take it over. When France is occupied by the Germans, the Japanese invade. This is why the Americans cut off their imports. This is what led to Pearl Harbor. Anyways, during the Japanese occupation, they faced resistance. They faced resistance from, from, from Vietnamese freedom fighters, many of whom are communist. One freedom fighter who's fighting against the Japanese is a young communist fighter named Ho Chi Minh. He is a communist. He has been trained as a communist uh, from his time in France. Remember, he's part of the French Empire. He travels to Paris, Marseille, etc. He is a communist, again, adopting a, a, a 19th century intellectual movement and bringing it to Indochina. Now, when he was fighting the Japanese, he was our friend. Even the Americans supported Ho Chi Minh because they are fighting against evil Japan. They're called freedom fighters. They're called heroes. Well, now Japan is gone. Is Vietnam going to be independent? No. No, 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 no. You're a freedom fighter when you fight against the Japanese. You are an insurgent when you fight against the French who are now back and want to reclaim Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh said no, 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 no. He writes a declaration of independence saying no, Vietnam is free. He wrote this. He wrote this. Tell me if this sounds familiar. This is in the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. He proclaimed, quote, we hold the truth that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Wait a minute. 
Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Wait a minute. Have you been infected? Have you been infected? Have you been infected with the ideals of the Enlightenment? That sounds very familiar. It almost sounds like John Locke and Jefferson. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Americans refused to recognize an independent Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh because that would mean that there is another communist nation in Asia. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We believe in the domino theory. If one nation falls to communism, they all fall to communism. And so we support the French. The Americans support the French. We pump them full of money. We pump them full of support. We pay for approximately 80% of this war fighting for the French to take back Indochina from these Vietnamese insurgents or freedom fighters, you decide. The Americans support the French in this war, the first Indochina war, sometimes called the Franco-Vietnamese war. The Soviets and the Chinese will support the North, the communists. Well, this war drags on between the French and the communists. The Americans continue to send money, guns, etc. Now, the French take the west of this region, but cannot take the east, controlled by the Viet Minh or the communists. It soon becomes very apparent that the French are not going to be able to win this war. Furthermore, support for the war back in France is waning. And so the dream of the French retaking Indochina falls apart in the aftermath. The French are defeated, the North is communist, and the South is controlled by pro-American, pro-capitalist government. Not free, not democratic, but pro-American and anti-communist. These two nations are supposed to be united. It was agreed. It was agreed that there are going to be negotiations held, there are held, and this should lead to a new election. Let the people decide, right? Popular sovereignty. So the North and the South agree to an election. When it becomes very apparent that Ho Chi Minh and the North are going to win, And whoever wins the election, pardon me, is going to take over the country, unite the country, and it's going to be their form of government. When it becomes apparent that the North and the communists are going to win this election, the South pulls out. And the United States refuses to apply any pressure to force the South back into these negotiations. And so the North is communist and the South is pro-capitalist, not democratic, but anti-communist. The North soon begins fighting against the South. The Vietnamese Civil War begins. The Americans support the South. They're anti-communist, and they are the last hope at securing freedom in Southeast Asia. Eisenhower sends money to the South. Kennedy sends advisors and money to the South. Wants to change his mind, uh, but then has a very bad day in Dallas, and so... Johnson becomes president. It's under Johnson that we, as the United States, get heavily involved in Vietnam, even though when he runs in 1964, he promises the American people, your children are not going to die in some godforsaken swamp in South Vietnam. He wants to enter the war, and we will soon enter the war. This is going to cost the United States not only tens of thousands of lives, but its very soul. Again, another lesson. But just know we are going to throw ourselves into this civil war. We did not learn the lesson from the French. The other region that the French are going to have a very difficult time in giving up is the uh, colony of Algeria on the northern coast of Africa, on the Mediterranean. Background on this conflict, on this independence movement. In 1830, France invaded Algeria. By the 1850s, it has firmly become a part of the French Empire. Over the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, many thousands of French and other Europeans come to settle in Algeria. It becomes a pivotal part of the French Empire. It's built up. It is part, an integral part of the French Empire. And by the 1950s, um, it, it becomes technically a part of France. 
at least on paper, at least on paper. Now, there's a lot of things, at least on paper. On paper, the Muslim native population is equal to those uh, white European Algerians that now live there in the hundreds of thousands. In reality, that is not true. The vast majority of the power and wealth is in the hands of European Algerians. They're called Pied Noirs, a black feet. There's a number of, of, of theories why that is. But just know it's a very unequal society in Algeria with the power in the hands of European Algerian-born Pied Noirs. With Indochina lost, many in Algeria see a chance. If the Vietnamese can do it, why can't we? And so the National Liberation Army, the National Liberation Army, supported by the Soviets and the Chinese, begin to demand more of a say by the majority Algerian native population. France, for the most part, ignores them. And with the support of the Soviets and the Chinese, the National Liberation Army begins attacking French targets, not only in Algeria, but also in France. This is going to build. This is going to build approximately, approximately 300,000 Algerians will join the uh, National Liberation Army with at least 40,000 civilian supporters. If you do not give us more of a say, then we want full independence. And this is what it quickly becomes. It becomes a war for independence. Native Algerians fighting against not just the French, but also their, those Pierre, Pied Noirs, those uh, European Algerians. This is a massive conflict taking place not just in Algeria, but back in France as well. This is a guerrilla campaign. We don't fight in organized uh, uh, armies and battalions like in traditional armies. Now, the French respond with brutal, brutal uh, countermeasures. Both sides are going to commit war crimes against one another. Also, the French are going to use, they're going to use about 170,000 French uh, uh, Muslim Algerians called Harkis. They're going to serve in the French army. About 170,000 native Muslim Algerians will serve the French. This isn't clear. It's a civil war in many ways. And, 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 and many people have different loyalties throughout this conflict. These are European Algerians. These are the so-called Blackfeet or Pied Noirs fighting for the French. This is a Harki. This is a native Algerian Muslim fighting for the French against the National Liberation Front. Now, it's very difficult to fight against a population that does not want to be ruled over. Countless empires and nation states have experienced this. The United States has experienced this, certainly. This is a prime example of what do you do if 75, 85, 95% of the population simply don't want you there? It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. It's also difficult if you are fighting an enemy that refuses to fight up front, that uses countermeasures, that uses bombings, sniper attacks, a guerrilla war. Overwhelmingly, the population wanted independence by the late 1950s. That being said, there were pro-French Algerians, as well as about 900,000 to a million European Algerians who support the French continuing to uh, uh, control this territory. This is a very complicated situation. France and Algeria, Algerian uh, 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 freedom fighters or insurgents fighting for control and the future of Algeria. Very complicated, very, very complex and very difficult to counter. The French authorities will use torture, brutality, and even murder to try to defeat the uh, Liberation Front. The Liberation Front will use assassinations and bombings. By the way, Pierre Noir terrorist groups will also do their own bombings. Many in France by the late 1950s have turned against keeping Algeria. Let them go. How many people have to die? There's also attacks going on back in Paris and in France. Here are members of the Front Liberation Nationale. 
terror attacks, bombings, sniper fire, assassinations. Both sides are guilty of terrible, terrible atrocities. And the bodies keep piling up. By 1958, many demand that Charles de Gaulle come back into politics. He is the hero of the Second World War. He led the French resistance. He's retired, but he comes back to rule. Many pro-imperial Frenchmen believe that de Gaulle is our man to crush these rebels. Charles de Gaulle shocks many when he says, you know what, let the Algerians decide. Let the Algerians decide. There is an attempted coup d'etat. The army almost succeeds in taking over France and killing Charles de Gaulle. There are several assassination attempts on Charles de Gaulle because he is willing to give up Algeria. He said, no, let the people decide. Very enlightened of him. Well, overwhelmingly, I'm talking about in the upper 90th percentile, the Algerians vote to leave the empire. The Algerians want independence. They want out of the empire of France. They achieve independence. A high cost. A very high cost. Deaths from this conflict, between 300,000 and 1.5 million Algerians are killed. 26,000 French soldiers are killed. 50,000 uh, Harkis, or Algerians fighting for the French, are killed. The flag of the Liberation Front becomes the flag of Algeria. It is independent by the early 1960s. 900,000 European Algerians flee Algeria once it achieves its independence. They are terrified of the uh, Liberation Front. 900,000 mostly go to France. What about those Algerians who fought for France? What about them? Well, France, for the most part, left them behind, and they were butchered. They were massacred. Um, a great many were killed, seen as traitors to their own people. France continued to have an empire, an albeit very small empire made up of Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Atlantic holdings. The effects The Algerian freedom fighters, or insurgents, whoever, whatever you want to call it, became a very influential model for anti-colonial liberation armies in other colonies in Africa and Asia over the 1950s and 1970s. Other groups will copy what they saw the FLN achieve. Remember the Sudan? Remember the Maxim gun? One man could tear down a thousand natives. They had the technological advance. Uh, they had the technological uh, advantage. Well, those days are over. The Algerians showed us that those days are over. Now, with a simple pipe bomb, I can wage war against a power much greater than myself. This becomes a model. This becomes a model across the world. More and more bombings more and more assassinations, more and more left-wing revolutionary groups working on the Algerian model wage war against nation states in the West. The Vietnamese will do this in the 1960s and 70s, a great many different groups. There'll be revolutionary German uh, groups. There'll be uh, uh, Arab groups. Look at this. This is an Arab nationalist reading Chairman Mao's musings what the hell's happening what in the hell's happening all of these movements are occurring they continue to this day these left-wing insurgency groups based on the algerian model the black panthers this is a black revolutionary leftist marxist group that emerges in oakland california in the 1960s dedicated to a black nationalist communist revolution based much of their understanding of count of, of, of insurgency on the Algerian model. They wanted to bring about a revolution, a left-wing revolution in this country. And Algeria was very much a part of this plan, this model. They'll visit Algeria, learn from Algeria.
The world is changing very, very quickly. The Suez crisis. This is a prime example of a world changing. By the middle 1950s, Egypt is controlled and led by Gamal Nasser. Gamal Nasser, he got rid of a pro-British Egyptian royal family, and he is in power by 1951, and he is a pan-Arabist. What in the heck is a pan-Arabist? He wants to unite the entire Arab world, not on religion. He's secular, but on their ethnicity, on their shared culture. He wants to see a United States of Arabia. He's a pan-Arabist. He also is very good at playing the Soviets and the Americans against each other. He is very good because remember, hearts and minds, both the Soviets and the Americans want to gain favor, especially in the Middle East. He's very good at this. How do we get to a crisis? Well, in 1956, the Americans refused to give Nasser money for him to build his Answar Dam. This is Egypt. Dams are very important. And so Nasser decides to nationalize Egypt's oil industry which was built up by the British, and end British and French control over the Suez Canal. The French and British built this canal up. He kicks him out and nationalizes it. He takes it over. Well, well, well. Whoever controls the Suez controls much of the world, and the British and the French want it back. They want it back. This is the crisis. And what do they do? Well, they hatch a plan with Israel Israel is going to attack Egypt on land. They want territory. They want security. And the British and the French are going to attack from the air. This is the Suez crisis. They begin bombing Port Said in Egypt as Israeli troops move across the Sinai Peninsula. Now, this isn't new. The British and the French have done this for centuries. Bombing port cities off of the coast of Africa. This is... This is what they do. They're protecting their national interests, are they not? Well, this is the big change. This is why it's so important. They're told to stop, stop, and they have to listen. Who in the hell tells the French and the British to stop anything? Oh, 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 wait a minute. Okay, sorry. Never mind. Never mind. The effects of the Suez crisis, it's clear. It's clear. A new era has been entered into. Proof that the old powers, the old world, are no longer the stewards of human history. These two powers, the French and the British, could literally sit down and carve up the world together. Those days are over. Those days are over. You are not the superpowers that you thought or that you were. Not thought, you were. Now, the French and the British are going to remain first world nations. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. They're certainly going to be major players in the world at a very diminished capacity. It's very clear. It's the Soviets in the United States now. What is more clear than that? A young man living in Egypt at this time is watching the world. He's watching the world he's a member of the muslim brotherhood um and he's traveled to the united states he's traveled to the united states he's seen what the americans have told the world is the best way to live he's been to the united states he studied here for two years at university a very accomplished man academically he has visited with american families he's seen these new communities of the suburbs little boxes that all look the same. We need it. We have a population surge, a housing crisis in the 1950s. Families sitting around watching this new invention, the television, watching other families. The supermarket that will soon replace Main Streets. Everything you need in one location. Plenty of parking up back. There's even new ways to consume food. Well, Saeed Kateb does not like what he sees. He says this, Americans suffered from, quote, a drought of sentimental sympathy and that Americans intentionally deride what people in the old world 
hold sacred. This is what Said Kuteb says about America. He writes about what he's seen in America. He says that Americans are obsessed with material possessions. They put that above God, above everything, material possessions. Americans are obsessed with violence, their television shows, their films, everything, violence, violence, violence. This is what he writes. They are sex obsessed, their films, their magazines, their fashion. You should see what their women wear. They're obsessed with it. They are also obsessed with what he called jungle music. He appreciated classical music, jungle music, referring to jazz and other forms of music. He said the Americans are obsessed with individual liberties, individual freedoms. Not the greater good, but the individual. Might be a leftover from the Enlightenment. They are also obsessed with money, capitalism, banking. They watch violent, violent sports where men kill each other for the amusement of the masses. Kuteb writes that America is obsessed with race, strict racial delineations. It's not important what God we worship, but what the color of our skin is. He also wrote that Americans have terrible haircuts. The 50s weren't the best time for American haircuts. That's my opinion. Okay, sue me. That Americans were obsessed with their lawns. Now, from a man from a desert, if you watch somebody for hours upon hours pour money and water into grass, you might think that is kind of weird. I can see that. I can understand that. He said that Americans have superficial relationships, that their friendships are skin deep. There's no meaningful bonds between Americans living in the suburbs, not even knowing really their neighbors. And he hated the fact. He thought it was, uh, uh, he thought it was animal-like, our mixing of the genders, men and women talking, being friendly with each other. My God, my God. And he hated American support for the nation state of Israel. By the late 1950s, America becomes a leading supporter of the nation state of Israel. He hates all of these things. And he gets to writing and publishing, and his ideas are going to be welcomed by pockets, small pockets of an eager audience. Kuteb declared that Western civilization was the enemy of Islam. He denounced leaders of Muslim nations for not following Islam closely enough. And he taught that jihad, holy war, should be undertaken not just to defend Islam, but to purify Islam. So we have our enemy outside of Islam, but inside of Islam as well. He wanted to see all Sunni Muslims unite under one caliphate, where Islam, the rules of Islam, will dictate how society runs. He rejected all of these modern isms and wanted to see an imagined return to an Islamic caliphate. Now, in 1966, he was convicted of plotting the assassination of Nasser in Egypt, and he is sentenced to hang. He dies. He's killed by the Egyptian government, but his ideas... His ideas become something more. They spread like a cough. It reaches an eager audience, especially when his brother goes to Saudi Arabia to continue the teachings of Kuteb. One man who learned Kuteb's ideas was Zohari. Now, he was a member. He was a member of the Islamic Jihad in Egypt. He goes on to mentor another young man with the ideas of Kuteb, a young Osama bin Laden. Ideas spread, right, like a virus, like a virus. Kuteb, like bin Laden, will reject nationalism, secularism, democracy, capitalism, communism, all of these isms of the modern age. Enlightenment ideals in the 1960s. Enlightenment ideals in the 1960s. Increasingly, many in the West came to criticize and in time reject ideals firmly established in the West since the 1700s. What do I mean? What do I mean? Well, increasingly, not entirely, but increasingly, citizens in the West come to question 
things that were unquestionable before, things that we got from that modern age, from the age of the Enlightenment. Things like feelings over reason. Trust your feelings over reason. It's my truth, not the truth. How many times have you heard that? It's my truth, not the truth. Truth then isn't universal. Truth isn't fixed. Oh, that's your truth. Okay, that is a rejection of the Enlightenment. Uh, relativism over objective truth. Well, that's well for them. That's best, or for them that works. That's relativism, not objective truth. Fixed truth. What's right now, a thousand year go, years ago, was true. Right? Was 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 a sound truth. The community over the individual. This really begins in the 1960s. Globalism over nationalism. Positive laws over natural laws. What is a positive law? That means laws that are made for the time and place rather than natural law, which is understood to be eternal and universal. Positive laws dealing with the issue right now or natural law. You see how we're questioning ideas of the Enlightenment right up to the present day. Freedom of the press, unless it questions too much. Freedom of speech, unless it offends too much. Freedom of assembly, unless it threatens too much. By no means were these things sacred and never crossed before the 1960s. Certainly they were. But criticisms and a realignment of truths occur in the 1960s and continues to this day. It's a rejection of the Enlightenment, and it increases and it increases. It's part of the postmodern world. Since the 1970s, humans have been living in a postmodern world. We have new forms of imperialism, new technologies, new ways of understanding our universe and our place in it, new forms of communicating and researching, new wants, new needs, new belief systems, new fears, new enemies. In the 1960s, humans literally go into space. By the late 1960s, they land on the moon. We have entered a new era, a postmodern era. Thank you all very, 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 very much. Good day.